In today's episode, I'm going to be discussing recent court rulings that are very important for Puerto Rico and very important for its future. And I'm also going to be discussing some very interesting recent announcements in regards to the next upcoming presidential elections. Hi, my name is Andrew Mercado Vasquez, and welcome to PRF Review, the show based on the podcast Puerto Rico Forward, which you can actually listen to on all platforms you listen to your podcasts on, including iTunes, including including Google. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on other platforms. Especially, you can go ahead and uh, check us out on Patreon, where you can actually support this, where you where you can actually help us grow this type of uh, project, and you can help. Uh, us in the long term. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, thank you so much for receiving this type of content, this video content so well. And uh, with your support, we hope to continue doing this and getting better at it. So let's just go straight into what we need to discuss today because it's it's a little bit, it's a little bit extensive. Uh, so let's go into it. First off, we're going to be talking about a court ruling that was, it comes from the United States Court of Appeals. Now, I actually covered this case in uh, our ongoing series uh, that covers Promesa, and I actually talked about the case of Aurelius, Aurelius Investments. Um, they actually have been questioning the validity of Promesa, and one of, the, one of the ways that they've been questioning the validity of Promesa is through uh, the way that the members, the board members, have been appointed. And uh, in, the, in the podcast episode, I actually talk about how uh, Judge Taylor Swain, which is the judge that's overlooking how the PROMESA process is, is going on and in regards to the Title III procedure, which is kind of like a bankruptcy procedure that the, that the law establishes, which we'll also be covering in the podcast. Um, she decided that essentially Puerto Rico by being covered by the Territorial Clause, the U.S. Constitution's Territorial Clause, uh, the way that the board members were appointed didn't necessarily have to follow the Appointments Clause of the U.S. Constitution. And they bas she basically ruled in favor of the board. What happens? Well, Aurelius and other parties, they went to the U.S. Court of Appeals, and they won. And the reason they won was because... Essentially, what the judge found, which is Judge Torruella, what he found was that you couldn't use the Territorial Clause to dismiss or to trump uh, the Appointments Clause. I'm going to read a few things directly from the opinion. Let's first talk about what the Appointments Clause is. I'm going to read straight from the court's uh, ruling. So the Appointments Clause establishes that, and I quote, the president shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of of the Senate shall appoint all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law. And it has other text. It has other, other things in it. And I'll continue reading it. But the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments, end of quote. So that's essentially what the Appointments Clause is. The president nominates and needs the advice and consent of the Senate. The process that PROMESA establishes basically turns that on its head, and I'm not going to go too much into detail in it because we cover that in the podcast, so you're going to have to go ahead and head over the podcast and that episode particularly. I think it's part two. I think it's part two of, uh, of the series of PROMESA. But essentially, that's the, the appointments clause. Now, what does the court talk, what does the court uh, say in regards to the appointments clause in, in this case particularly? The way that PROMESA works is the following. I'm going to read again from the, from the opinion. In synthesis, pursu pursuant to this scheme, the scheme established by PROMESA, six of the seven board members shall be selected by the president from the lists provided by House and Senate leadership with PROMESA allowing the president to select the seventh member at his or her sole discretion. End of quote. So there we see that the, the actual nominations, as you could, you could say, they come from 
the House and the Senate. They, they don't actually come from the president in this case. And that was the issue that was being brought up by Aurelius. I'm going to read again from the opinion because the, the, the opinion does a good job clarifying these issues. I'm going to read straight from it. Before the district court, Aurelius argued... Remember, Aurelius is the, is the uh, petitioner here. Argued that the board lacked authority to initiate the Title III proceeding because its members were appointed in violation of the Appointments Clause and the principle of separation of powers. The board rejected this argument, posi- I'm sorry, positing that its members were not officers of the United States within the meaning of the Appointments Clause and that the board's powers were purely local in nature, not federal, as would be needed to qualify for, for Appointments Clause coverage. The board further argued that in any event, the Appointments Clause did not apply, even if the individual members were federal officers, because they exercised the authority in Puerto Rico, an unincorporated territory where the the Territorial Clause endows Congress with plenary powers, end of quote. So what's the board saying? Either way, you can say that they're officers of the U.S. or not. Puerto Rico is a territory, and therefore covered by the Territorial Clause, so it doesn't matter Essentially, if Congress wanted to do it this way, it has to be done this way. In a nutshell, that's, that's what the reasoning boils down to. Now, of course, the court does not buy this. And f- further down in the opinion, court states the following, and I quote, The territorial clause is one of general application authorizing Congress to en- engage in rulemaking for the, te- for the temporary governments of territories. But such a general empowerment does not extend to areas where the Constitution explicitly contemplates a particular subject, such as the appointment of federal officers. End of quote. Now, the opinion continues talking about that in in the court ruling. And towards the end, essentially, what it states is the following, and I'm going to quote again. Accordingly, we hold that the present provisions allowing the appointment of members, of board members, in a matter other than by presidential nomination followed by the Senate's confirmation are invalid and severable. End of quote. And in conclusion, conclusion, it states the following, I quote one more time, In sum, we hold that the board members, other than the ex officio member, must be and were not appointed in compliance with the Appointments Clause. Accordingly, the district court's conclusion to the contrary is reversed. So essentially what's going to happen now is that the the board members need to be uh, named in accordance to the Appointments Clause. Now, of course, the board is going to fight this. And what are they going to do? Well, they're already, they've already announced that they're going to appeal to the Supreme Court. In an article uh, published by Reuters, and uh, it seems that it was published, yes, the 28th of February, a couple of days ago, they mentioned that the Puerto Rico Oversight Board is going to appeal and uh, the article itself is titled Puerto Rico Oversight Board to Appeal Appointments Ruling. And it gives you a nice little uh, review of what's going on. Now, what's interesting is that the article concludes stating the following. The Supreme Court hears less than 100 of the thousands of appeals filed each year. If it were to take up the Puerto Rico case, it would likely be decided in its next term, which starts in October and ends in June 2020. So it's going to be a while. Maybe it's going to be a while for us to be able to figure out what's going to happen uh, at the end of the day. But so far, it's been an, it's an interesting opinion to read because originally what you were looking at was that the, ter- the territorial clause was standing at odds with the appointments clause in regards to PROMESA. And the way that that, that has been worked out so far is always giving, uh, giving into the territorial clause. But... It seems here that the the Court of Appeals is going to tread back on that and not give so much power to the terri- to a territorial clause. Okay, now that's a, that covers that court ruling. What's the second one? Well, the second one is actually a completely different case, but it's very important either way for Puerto Rico as a whole. It's uh, United States of America, U.S. versus 
Jose Luis Vallejo Madero. Um, we actually, in, in, in Puerto Rico Forward, the podcast, we covered this case as well. And what we're seeing here is now the opinion and order of the case uh, by Judge Helpi. Uh, this is an interesting case. Essentially, what this, what, this, uh, what this case is about is that this man lived in the continental U.S. He received Social Security income benefits, or SSI benefits. Um, he qualified for them, and he, he was receiving them for some time. Then he moved to Puerto Rico, and when he moved to Puerto Rico, he continued receiving the benefits. Suddenly, the U.S. government comes in, says that he can't be receiving these benefits because he moved to a territory, which is Puerto Rico, and they actually try to make him pay back the benefits that, that he had received. And in the opinion, they basically summarize this in the following way, and I'll quote, Vallejo Madero contends he is not required to return the payments he received in Social Security income disability benefits upon changing his domicile to Puerto Rico since excluding a United States citizen residing in the territory from receiving the same, the same runs afoul of the Equal Protection Guarantee of the Due Process Clause. End of quote. So essentially, that's the argument that the that Mr. Vallejo Madero uh, presents to the court. He's saying, you know, it's not fair in light of being a U.S. citizen and in light of the guarantees provided by the Due Process Clause for me to have to pay back the benefits that I was given lawfully just because now I'm in a U.S. territory. The court actually ends up agreeing with him, and further down the opinion, um, they analyze essentially what the SSI program is, and I'll quote very briefly, um, the SSI program was created to aid the nation's aged, blind, and disabled persons who qualify due to proven economic need. Unlike Social Security and Medicare, individuals do not contribute toward the SSI program. End of quote. Now, further down in the opinion, here's where, we get, where things get interesting. Judge Helby states the following, and I quote, The territorial clause is not a blank check for the federal government to dictate when and, when and where the Constitution applies to its citizens. The Constitution grants Congress and the President the power to acquire, dispose of, and govern territory, not the power to decide when and where its terms apply, end of quote. So between this case and the one I, I already discussed, what we're looking at is that the territorial clause is being looked at from a different angle than it had been in past decades. Now it's actually being scrutinized. It's being tended to from the point of view of, of its consequences, not necessarily from the point of view of its purpose. So let's continue reading a little bit on the opinion because it's important for me to, to, to just cover this because it opens the door to future questions in regards to what benefits are being um, out of reach or are placed out of reach of, of people that live in Puerto Rico just for the sole fact of living in the territory. So I'm just going to read the conclusion or the reasoning behind the conclusion and I'll quote. It is the government's role to protect the fundamental rights of all United States citizens. Fundamental rights are the same in the states as in the territories without distinction. Equal protection and due process are fundamental rights afforded to every United States citizen, including those who under the United States flag make Puerto Rico their home. End of quote. Now, this is a, these, these are very powerful words. And uh, the way that this judge approaches the, the territorial clause is a little bit different than the way the other judge does, because here it's actually, it's actually being seen from the point of view of an individual being affected by the territorial clause. In, 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 in the first case, what we're looking at is the board of the oversight board and PROMESA and, and things that more at a macro level, you know. But... In this case, talking about a person specifically being affected by the way Puerto Rico is treated. And so there you have two court opinions that are very interesting. They both talk about the territorial clause. They both kind of remove 
some of, of its plenary power necessarily because the territorial clause stands at odds with other clauses of the same constitution. So it's important for everyone to read these cases at least once to get a, uh, uh, an idea of how the territorial clause first affects Puerto Rico as a whole through PROMESA, for example, and then how the territorial clause can affect one person individually. So when we're talking, when we're talking about the Puerto Rico issue, we're talking about people as a nation, but we're talking about individual lives as well being affected by this injustice that is colonialism. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, something happened um, recently in regards to the presidential race. As everyone knows by now, Bernie Sanders is going to run for president again. Um, what some of you might not know is one of the co-chairs in his presidential candidacy and running his campaign, essentially, is the mayor of San Juan, Carmen Julin. And maybe some of you know her because she came out in the news in, 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 in regards to criticizing how the president, President Trump, has handled Maria and the way that FEMA has handled Maria. And she was very vocal. Um, some of you might remember her because she, she actually got kind of in a Twitter war with President Trump. Trump called her nasty, and she basically took that as, as a compliment. She got, a, she got a, t a t shirt made with the word nasty on it. So she's a figure, she's a public figure that's actually had some impact in regard to the discussion of Puerto Rico because by being someone that's being talked about, Carmen Julian Cruz, like the mayor, the mayor herself, she's also serving as a platform for the Puerto Rico issue to come to light. Now, I'm not particularly defending or aligning myself with Carmen Julian Cruz or aligning myself with Bernie Sanders, but I do need to recognize, and everyone should recognize, that the fact that a major presidential candidate, someone that a lot of people believe to have a real chance to become the next president of the U.S., has incorporated it into probably one of the most important positions of his campaign, someone like Carmen Julian Cruz, a well-known Puerto Rican. And what that presents is the opportunity of bringing the Puerto Rico issue into the minds, into the consciousness of people that otherwise wouldn't even think about it. Now, as I tweeted out when I learned about this, what's crucial in, in, this, in this juncture is to be able to, to keep these people accountable. Because one thing is for Bernie Sanders to talk about Puerto Rico um, in a superficial manner, the way that any other candidate would talk about Puerto Rico, but another thing is to actually bring into his team someone that is vocally... Uh, opposed to President Trump, and it's, it's obvious that she's from Puerto Rico. It's someone that you talk about and can't escape talking about the Puerto Rico issue. And that just brings the accountability that much higher. We cannot allow this to become a parody. We cannot allow this to become just a lost opportunity where... Uh, where essentially you have a candidate using the Puerto Rico issue to be able to highlight the, the deficiencies in the, uh, the, the opposing candidate. We can't use the Puerto Rico issue um, in that way. We need to make sure the Puerto Rico issue actually becomes a policy issue. And holding Bernie Sanders and Carmen Julian Cruz accountable for failing to use this moment in history to really bring the Puerto Rico issue forward is crucial if they don't do it. I mean, I'll celebrate any advance, advancement of the Puerto Rico issue, um, but I'm also going to call out people that use the Puerto Rico issue just to advance their own, their own interests and not the interests of the people of Puerto Rico. So let's keep an eye on that. Let's keep an eye on uh, Bernie Sanders because if he wants to make this move into aligning himself with, with, with 
bringing the Puerto Rico issue to visibility, it needs to come with actual structured policies implemented to be able to address the Puerto Rico issue. It can't be just talk about Puerto Rico to talk about how bad uh, it was handled by the Republican Party. It can't be that because that doesn't solve any major issue really. What it does is that it, it makes you look good. But if, you do, if, if someone doesn't have the interests of the, the people of Puerto Rico at heart and just uses that in their, in their personal advancement of their own agenda, then I think that's worse than not talking about it at all to a certain degree. But I digress. What we need to do is keep our eyes on these, these individuals, Bernie Sanders and Carmen Julian Cruz, and make sure that they use their platform, they use this opportunity to advance the Puerto Rico issue, to solve it finally, and to make great steps into allowing Puerto Rico to finally move out of this horrible legal and economic limbo that it lives in uh, as a result of its colonial condition. Well, as always... Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Y que viva Puerto Rico.